Thank you. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate that. Really glad to be here. Thank Absolutely. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys for that warm welcome. Uh, we're going to make this a little bit more interactive, keep things a little informal here. I frequently say this when I give the beginning of a talk when I actually want people to speak their minds freely. You know, think about an idea like a set of clothes. All right, you try it on. If it fits, you get to keep it. If it doesn't fit, you get to put it back on the rack. That's what we're going to do tonight. I'm going to lay some ideas out. I'm going to share with you what I think needs to be done with the country. And then you guys get to tell me what you thought of that. Challenge me with your questions. And let's actually live out the ideals that America was supposed to represent. Free speech and open debate. That's how we settle our questions in this country. I'll tell you this too. And you want to know how well America is doing as a country? Take a look at this. What is the gap? between what people are willing to say in public and what they're willing to say in private. When that gap is wide, we're not doing well as a country. When we close that gap, that means we're doing better. We want tonight to be one of those nights where we close that gap. So be unafraid. I'll do the same, and we'll have some fun tonight. Tell you a bit about my own background. My parents came to this country in the late 1970s, in my dad's case, in the early 1980s, in my mom's case. We used to ask my dad, why'd you come halfway around the world to Cincinnati, Ohio, of all places, from India? And he said that was the only place where he could actually be close and find a job to his sister, who was in Fort Wayne, Indiana. That, of course, begged the question of why his sister came halfway around the world to Fort Wayne, Indiana. And the family joke is it's the only US state with the word India contained in the name of the state. So that was a story of how my family ended up in the Midwest. I was born and raised in Ohio. Thought I was going to be a scientist, ended up going to college. When I was in college, I studied molecular biology. I was one of those nerdy guys in the lab. Thought I was going to be a doctor and a scientist. Ended up getting into the world of biotech investing, investing in the companies that were developing cutting edge therapies. I ended up making some contrarian investments, some investments that weren't very popular at the time to cure a disease called hepatitis C virus. That ended up actually giving me financial success at a very early age. And we don't have to talk about politics the whole time tonight. If you're on a college audience, you want to talk about how to actually get ahead in the system of American capitalism. I'm happy to talk about some of those lessons too. By my late 20s, I had had enough success that I was able to then leave my job as an investor and start my own biotech company. And so I built that company up as a CEO for seven years. We ended up working on a number of medicines in areas that big pharma had ignored. One of those areas was actually a development of a drug for a rare genetic disease in kids, where 20 of these kids are born every year. 100% of them, if they're untreated, die by the age of three. And with a therapy that we worked on in partnership with a university, actually, 100% of these kids, or not 100%, but the majority of these kids can live lives of a more normal duration. So that was an example of the kind of medicine I worked on worked on a drug that's now approved for prostate cancer, another one for psoriasis, range of other diseases. That was what my life was. But then I stepped down from my job as a CEO. It was a multi-billion dollar business. And I stepped down to focus on a different kind of cancer. And the reason I stepped down was that there was a demand that landed on my doorstep to make a statement in favor of a social cause that I didn't agree with. The Black Lives Matter movement in 2020, when was, yeah, it was, it was 2020, summer of 2020, when George Floyd tragically died, there was a demand that CEOs in this country take one position on the side of a Black Lives Matter movement, very controversial issue. I chose not to make that statement, but instead to say that my company, like every company in this country, should be focused on how we make a difference, making medicines for patients who need them. That's what unites us. Turns out that was actually a very controversial thing to say at the time. That led to six months, which culminated in several advisors to my company then stepping down the following January, and I had to make a choice. Was I going to speak freely as a citizen, or was I going to speak through the filter of corporate self-interest? And ever since then, in January 2021, I decided that I was going to speak freely as a citizen. You can agree with me or disagree with me. I'm going to say what I have to say. You get to say what you have in return. And I was on a mission across corporate America to say, we want politics out of the corporate boardrooms. 
so that we could settle our political differences the way it was supposed to be settled in America, through free speech and open debate through the political process. And the long story short is, after writing a few books, traveling the country, I decided that the right way to settle those political differences was indeed through the political process. That's what led me to run for president of the United States. And I'll kick it off with this before opening it up to some questions. The thing that really caused me to run was that I led companies, multiple companies that I built, staffed by young people, earnest people I had hired straight out of college in many cases. That was something that you weren't supposed to do in the biotech industry. It was an unconventional move. We did it. Why were we able to hire them? We were able to hire them because they wanted to have a positive impact. They wanted to do something positive, making medicines for patients who needed them. That was a worthy purpose to many of them. But those same employees were the ones, many of whom were upset with me when I didn't make that statement in favor of the Black Lives Matter movement. And, and my net diagnosis of what's going on in the country really is that young people in this country, but really not just young people, all of us, if we're really being honest about it, we're hungry for a cause. We're hungry for purpose. We're hungry for meaning. We're hungry for identity. At a moment in our history when the things that used to fill that void, things like faith, patriotism, belief in your country, hard work, family, these things have disappeared. And when you lose these sources of truth, you then have a vacuum in your heart that runs so deep that poison then fills the void. To me, that's what accounts for the rise of racial wokeism, identity politics, climate religion, transgenderism, COVIDism. These are controversial things to say, but that's okay. I'm sharing with you my views. These are the kinds of things that prey on that vacuum in our heart. And I think what we need to do, forget Republican and Democrat labels, what we need to do as leaders in this country every one of us, leaders in our own ways, is to fill that void with the vision of what it means to be American, a vision of American national identity that runs so deep that it dilutes the poisonous agendas to irrelevance. That is how we win. We're like bats, blind bats roaming around in a cave. We can't see where we are. We're lost. The way a bat figures out where it is, is it sends out a signal, sonar signal, echolocation. It bounces off a wall, it bounces back, it says, okay, here's where I am. We send a signal, we say, hey, where am I? Okay, belief in a God. Okay, that bounces back, it's part of my identity. A member of a family, these are the two parents that brought me into this world, bounces back, tells me, okay, this is who I am. Hard work, things that I've created in the world, can be proud of, okay, it bounces back. Citizen of a nation bounces back, tells me where I am. You know what happens today when those things disappear? We send those signals and we don't get anything back. That's where we are as a country. When I was growing up over the last 15 years, I'm only 37 years old. I was you know, older compared to many of you, but young compared to the other people running for president. I'm a millennial, born in 1985, first ever millennial to run for US president as a Republican. I grew up in a generation that was trained to celebrate diversity, to celebrate, by definition, what does diversity mean? Celebrate our differences. So much that we forgot all the ways we're really just the same as Americans, bound by a common set of ideals that set this country into motion 250 years ago. I'm running for president because I believe deep in my bones that those ideals still exist. And the reason I'm running is to revive them. Revive that idea you see at the bottom of every one of your coins, e pluribus unum, from many, one. That's the vision that set this nation into motion I think that's the vision that can kickstart this nation again. The only way we're gonna do it 
is by starting to talk openly again with one another. Once we do it, I think we'll discover that most of us actually agree on those basic principles, as difficult as that is to believe in today's divided environment. I think that that's true. But the only way we start to do it is by breaking down those barriers to conversation amongst ourselves as fellow co-equal citizens. And that's what we're going to do tonight. So I'm looking forward to hearing your questions. Thanks for the warm welcome. Let's make this a conversation. Thank you. Oh, first question already. Let's do it. Yeah. So I'm always a fan of defining words before you use them. So how do I define woke culture before I offer my perspective on it? So wokeness is a worldview that calls on us, all of us, to wake up. That's the origin of the word woke. To wake up to invisible societal injustices based on genetically inherited characteristics, specifically race, gender, and sexual orientation. And it says that you're either a member of an oppressor class or an oppressed class based on the combination of those characteristics, and that there are injustices in this world arising from that oppression, and that all of us have a job to play, no matter how we do it, not just through politics, but even through the economy, to correct for those injustices. I think I stated that definition in a way that anyone on any side of this debate would still at least agree on that definition. That's what it means to be woke. Here's my problem with it. I think it calls on us to see one another based on the color of our skin rather than on the content of our character as Martin Luther King admonished us to 60 some odd years ago. I think it teaches us to see ourselves as victims rather than victors, because the more victimized you are, the more oppressed you are, which means the more you deserve to be saved. Saved by who? That's a good question. So I think that's a, what began as a challenge to the system in an earnest way, I think, mostly, actually. People who wanted to make a difference, address injustice, generally young people back when I was a young person 20 years ago, what began as a challenge to the system and by the way, I respect anybody who challenges the system. Whatever that is, that takes guts to do. Stand up to the system, stick it to the man, be heterodox. That takes some courage. I'll give credit to the people who spawned that movement so many years ago. What began as a challenge to the system became the system. Mostly when it met Wall Street, actually. And I wrote a whole book about this. In the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis, what happened was Occupy Wall Street. Raise your hand if you remember or heard of Occupy Wall Street before. Actually, most of you. It's been long enough that I have to ask that question. Occupy Wall Street wanted to take money from those wealthy corporate fat cats and redistribute it to poor people to help poor people. But Wall Street noticed that there was actually this new movement on the left that said, well, it's not about economic injustice and poverty anymore. It's about race, gender, sexual orientation, and maybe a little bit of climate change sprinkled on top. And so we'll get in bed with that. That works for us. Occupy Wall Street, not so good. New woke stuff, pretty good. Put some token minorities on your boards. You muse about the racially disparate impact of climate change after you fly in a private jet to Davos. It's pretty good work if you can get it. It's great. Diversity and inclusion, we'll say it as much as you want. But we effectively expect the left to look the other way when it comes to leaving our corporate power intact. So it was this arranged marriage that then, weirdly, got these two strange bedfellows together. A progressive woke movement that was supposed to challenge the system that got literally married with the financial system and then Silicon Valley and the powers that be to create this new, what I call, woke industrial complex, which is really a bunch of people in power who pretend like they care about something other than profit and power precisely to gain more of each. That's a bastardization of the even earnest version of the woke movement itself. That's why the title of my first book isn't just woke, it is Woke Inc., actually. That's actually what I have the biggest problem with. So anyway, that's, uh, I think, a trend in America that's divided us to a breaking point. It's now become a popular talk track word amongst fellow Republicans, many of whom say the words but don't know what they mean. Often, like billiard balls hit in a direction, they go in whatever direction they're hit without knowing why they're headed there. I don't think that's good either. 
But I think what we do need to do is go beyond just identifying the problem to ask ourselves, how are we going to address that divisive issue in American life? And I think the way we address it is by reviving a shared national identity that dilutes this divisive ideology or any other one to irrelevance. And that is what I'm in this race to do, to deliver that national identity. It's a great question, man. Thank you for it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Hi there. Thank you. Where does my son is from? I'm Beth. I'm from Warren Hayes, which is the town next door. As you can tell, I have a little golden hair. And a few people in this room also have lived this way and think are. And some are approaching. So my concern is I've heard a lot of conversations about budget cuts and more specifically, cuts to Social Security and Medicare. Yep. Financial security and health care security are very important. A lot of seniors are in a very fixed situation, which limits options. If elected, I'd be interested in hearing what your plan is. Yes. So I think, great question. And I think we need to surface these debates and just answer honestly where we stand, okay? We do have a national debt problem in this country. The national debt problem is driven by spending more money systematically over a very long period of time versus the amount of money that the government takes in. That's an issue. Now it's coming to a head. We have to address it. Democrats generally say the solution is raising taxes to increase the revenue base of the government. They'll say that that helps the national debt because it increases revenue for the government. Here's the problem. That has an effect of shrinking the economy over time because people have less of an incentive to work and create things if they're going to be taxed. The general view in the Republican Party, espoused by fellow presidential candidates, including Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis, and Ron DeSantis is a presidential candidate for all intents and purposes, they would say that, no, 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 the thing we need to do is not raise the taxes, but do the spending cuts. Well, what do they mean? They mean cutting Social Security and Medicare benefits, because that's really any other spending cut doesn't move the needle if you're talking about spending cuts. I think there is a third and better way. It shocks me that not a single presidential candidate in this race is talking about it, because it is so obvious, restoring GDP growth itself in this country. GDP stands for the gross domestic product. It refers to sort of the overall amount of money we make. That's the, right, that's the right colloquial way to think about it. We used to grow at 4% plus per year for most of our national history. In the last couple of decades, in the last few decades, it's now a parsley one point something percent. All of our projections that say we're going to run out of money, that the national debt is going to be a problem, rely on extrapolating that forward, one point something percent, and then, hey, guess what? By 20 whatever, 2040, 2050, 2070, depending on the projection, we'll be out of money. If we can restore that GDP growth rate to be back above 3%, let alone back to 4%, and I want a GDP growth plan that I'm running on this race on to put us above 5%, if we can put a man on the moon, this is gonna be a lot easier than that, I'll tell you how we're gonna do it. We grow our way out of our problems. See, everybody else is thinking small, you know, wearing bifocal glasses and trying to play accounting with this versus asking ourselves, how do we unleash the American economy? We start by unleashing the American spirit, which is what I talked about. That's why I talk about national identity first, not because I don't care about the economy, but because I do. That sense of self-confidence, that's actually what allows us to unleash the American economy. But I'll give you two examples of things that the next president can do if I'm elected, I will do to unleash the GDP growth in this country that we've been missing. The two obstacles to GDP growth today are one, the constraints we've applied to the American energy sector. And that is directly the demands, based on the demands of the climate cult in America. The climate cult is a farce. It is based on a farcical religious conviction in a set of premises that the country has been duped into believing, and I will go, I mean, I don't like to brag on my credentials, okay, but I, let's just say, told you a nerdy science guy, saw that all the way through, great. We'll have that debate and get into details if you want to. 
It is based on a fraudulent set of premises that has guided the West, and America in particular, to put itself in a straitjacket when it comes to producing energy by drilling, fracking, and burning coal. That's the number one obstacle to GDP growth. The number two obstacle to GDP growth is that we lack workers in this country. Most businesses want to hire workers. There aren't enough workers with the right skills. There's two issues that led to it. One is a habit of the government, really over 60 years, but including over the last three years, including under both last administrations, Trump and Biden included, raining money from on high like mana from heaven, that caused people to get addicted to what they were fed from the government that gave them an incentive not to work. But the bigger problem really goes back to Lyndon Johnson and his so-called Great Society Project, which again showered money, especially on lower income families, giving them incentives not to work. Those are the two obstacles to GDP growth. Fix the worker shortage, unshackle American energy, and we're on a path back to three or four plus percent GDP growth. And with a few other things I want to put in place, like a reform of the Federal Reserve, we're back at five plus percent GDP growth. We grow our way out of our problems. That's what American exceptionalism looks like. And we do it the way we lead ourselves out of the national debt crisis isn't by cutting your Social Security or your Medicare. It's by the next generation doing what your generation did for this country, by actually leading with global economic leadership, American exceptionalism. That is what we need to revive, and that's what I'm in this race to deliver. And it is so obvious that it is staggering to me that not a single other presidential candidate on either side of the aisle has embraced it. I will. It's the top of my domestic agenda. Thank you for that question. Appreciate it. Great question. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dom. I'm a student here at Women's College. And uh, my question for you today is, obviously we see it's a huge topic uh, in the government right now with gun control. Uh, say, say it again. Gun control. Gun control. Uh, and I have a supporter of guns first, you know, growing up in a very gun-friendly household. And uh, I want to know what your plan is if you were elected to the office of what you do to either support or maybe even go bipartisan. So here's how I look at it. First principles. Okay, you said you grew up in a gun-friendly household. I'll be honest with you, I did not. Actually, my parents were immigrants to this country. We didn't go hunting. We didn't go sport shooting. I can probably tell you the number of times I've been to a shooting range, counted on one hand. I like it, but it's not my main hobby. But the reason I'm a gun owner is that I believe in the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment is the one that gives teeth to every other amendment in this country. I'm not going to be able to recite it off the top of my head, but I'm going to give you a couple of quotes, okay? Have some fun with this. The, what did they say? The, uh, the liberty of individuals shall not be restrained by an overreaching government. It's a quote from the Constitution of Iran, actually. It's 170, 177 of these lines. Iran actually, after, well, our Bill of Rights just has 10 of them. They've got 177. That's how much freedom they give you in Iran, except the one thing it's missing is the Second Amendment. China, really similar things. China, this one makes me laugh, because I've done business in China. I've been an exchange student in China. Actually, in my senior year at Harvard, went to the Harvard of China, Beida. I, I understand that's a whole dark and twisted regime over there. But they will say, uh, the, the, what did they say? You cannot infringe the property rights of a person and cannot unlawfully detain an individual. This is a joke if you live in CCP-controlled China. But again, why? They don't have a Second Amendment. And they actually ban citizens from owning guns, just like Iran does. So the reality is that when you don't have the backstop of the Second Amendment, that's what allows the government to reach as far as it does. So I don't think the right approach here is compromise. I think it's being uncompromising about the principles of that Second Amendment. Actually, even in this country, let me just take my survey by way of hands here. Who here knows what the first anti-gun laws in America were? Who did they target? Nailed it. After the Civil War. Good job. What is your name? Are you a student? Here? What year? Freshman. Give this, where did the guy go to high school? Give him a round of applause. <laughs> 
God bless your history teacher in high school because your history teacher did something good. The, num the number one gun control law that first existed in the United States was designed to say, okay, we fought this civil war to give black Americans the liberties that they were not given at this country's founding. We thought we fixed it. Except there was one little twist. The southern states passed laws that said that black people couldn't own guns. That is how you get to KKK to Jim Crow, to Martin Luther King Jr. himself being denied unfairly a concealed carry permit by J. Edgar Hoover's FBI. So that's why I think the Second Amendment's important. I'm going to go on from a tangent here. I haven't shared this before in the campaign trail, but it's just the way I think of it. So who here has heard the term mutually assured destruction, MAD, during the Cold War? Does that name mean anything to you? A couple of the more experienced members of the audience raised their hand there, right? So, so that's good. So, so, so the basic idea was, the basic idea was that the Soviet Union and the U.S., actually would never go to war with each other because both sides had nuclear weapons. And so it was mutually assured destruction. And turned out they never went to war with each other. Well, why didn't they go to war with each other? Because each side knew that the other side was armed in a way that it was in neither side's interest to do it. The founding fathers of this country, they basically wove in mutually assured destruction into the Constitution between the government and its people, between the government and the governed. That's really what the Second Amendment is about. It doesn't sound, you know, <laughs> makes your stomach feel a little uncomfortable if you remember that. It's not about hunting and sports shooting. That's what it's really about. But the Founding Fathers knew, actually not place far as well like being in New Hampshire, not far from here, places like Concord, Lexington, where the first shots were fired in the American Revolution, the shots that were heard around the world, they were because the British monarchy tried to take away the guns of the American Revolutionary soldiers. And that was why the founding fathers of this country said, we will never do to our people what the British monarchy tried to do to us. So I think the right answer, whatever it is, can't be trampling on that freedom. Now, what do we do with this epidemic of mass shootings in our country? It has gone up in the last 50 years. There's no doubt about it. Well, I think the number one thing we do is we address the mental health epidemic that actually accounts for it, an epidemic of fatherlessness in this country. You know what all of those mass shooters have in common? They grew up in an unstable family household, and they're mentally unstable due to mental health conditions that we haven't addressed. You want to know what happened in the meantime? The rise of the internet, the rise of social media companies. We should ban addictive social media usage in kids under the age of 16 instead of actually taking guns away from law-abiding adults in this country. We should actually go upstream and create policies that foster true stable family formation sooner than actually taking guns away from law-abiding adults in this country. The per capita gun ownership isn't that different. The mental health epidemic is what's different over the last 50 years. And for schools in particular, that strikes a special place in my heart. I've got two kids. One of them is about to be old enough to enter the public school system. He's three years old. You know, by the time he turns five, he'll be in kindergarten. I think it is unconscionable that we protect our shopping malls, the thousands standing around TSA at the airports, more than we actually protect our own kids in schools. So one of the things I've said, somewhat controversially, I have to admit, was that if elected as US president, I would shut down the US Department of Education. Not because I don't care about education, but because I do, actually. They spend $83 billion on worse than nothing on agendas that actually set back education in this country, including, by the way, tilting the scales to four-year college degrees without actually offering any help to people who want to get a one-year program to be a welder or a mechanic or anything else. I think that's one of the many things they do wrong. But if we shut down the Department of Education for just a quarter of that budget, we could put three armed security guards in every public school in this country. You want to protect the kids, let's protect the kids. That's exactly how we do it. And so, I think that it might be a fashionable and politically convenient thing to say. To say we want to take away guns, that's not the right answer. It's to go upstream, solve the mental health epidemic, secure the schools, solve the fatherlessness problem, and then we'll actually have a revival. Great question, very honest. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. 
Yeah, so thank you for bringing it up. I think the trans issue is a symptom of that deeper sense of feeling lost in our country. We're lost in the desert. I'm gonna share with you my opinion. I think more often than not, especially when a kid tells you that they're born in the wrong body and that their gender is different from their biological sex, that means they're suffering from a mental health condition. And we should not go out of our way to affirm that confusion. We should actually be compassionate. That is not cruel. The compa that's not compassionate, that is cruel. The compassionate thing to do is figure out what's actually going on in that kid's life, reach out and help them. And yet today, we're going in the other direction by offering these kids and even foisting on these kids genital mutilation, chemical castration, puberty blockers that make permanent changes to their lives that many of them will and already do go on to regret. I think that is wrong. I think the assault on women's sports in particular, I spent actually in a podcast that was released today, I had a conversation with Riley Gaines. She's a young woman. She was the top female swimmer in this country. She's the top women's swimmer in this country. But it turns out a man got the award for it who chose to compete in women's competition. I think it's degrading to women. I think it's a farce. I think it rejects what the essence of the feminist movement in this country taught us 30 years ago, that there are many ways to be a woman. There's not one way to be a woman. You don't have to just look a certain way, dress a certain way, have a certain kind of makeup or body type, and that's what it means to be a woman. No, you be a woman the way you know how to be a woman. And you know what? They would say the same thing about men. There's many ways to be a man. You can marry who you want, if you want, dress how you want, when you want. That's what it means to be a man and a free man. That's what it means to be a woman and a free woman. And today, instead, we say, no, 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 no. There's only one way to be a woman. It's by adopting the external characteristics of femininity. I think that that's a, that, that, I mean, you tell me. I think that's an insult to women. I think it's an insult to men. And I think that it's degrading and causes us to respect one another less and to fetishize the genetic attributes we inherit on the day we're born instead of saying that there's many ways to be a man, many ways to be a woman, but there is such a thing that we call truth. That there are certain things that are true in the world. That there is such a thing as a man. That there is such a thing as a woman. And there is such a thing as a mental health disorder. And if you don't treat an anorexic with liposuction, then you certainly shouldn't be treating a kid who suffers from a mental health condition with genital mutilation surgery either. That's where I am on the transition. If you don't mind me asking, what's your perspective on it as a young woman and maybe an athlete yourself? And you're a freshman, you said you're 18. So maybe I rewind back 20 years ago. The debates we were having back at that time in this country were actually about Title IX. Title IX was very controversial. Actually, most conservatives were, many conservatives were against it. It was mostly a progressive issue that people were in favor of, in favor of women's sports that said, no, no, no this deserves to exist as a category. That sports isn't just about who amongst humanity can sprint the fastest or lift the most weight, but who can reach the pinnacle of his or her own achievement separately in a category where we acknowledge there are real differences between men and women and recognize that there is something worthy, something honorable, something beautiful about each gender being able to achieve their maximal potential. And the debate settled out where it did. I think that side won the day. And I think they were right in retrospect, fostering women's sports in a way that wouldn't have happened without somebody taking that step. But the counter argument against it at the time used to be that we don't need women's sports because it's just 
whoever swims the fastest that wins in the end or sprints the fastest or even in a MMA competition. I actually posted a video on this the other day. I mean, there's literally a biological man on stage beating the living daylights out of one woman, one woman after another on stage in mixed martial arts and saying, I'm gonna come for the rest of you women. When I was growing up, we used to call that violence against women. Today, we celebrate that as trans. I think it's wrong. But I think that that actually, the argument in some ways was the old conservative argument against Title IX that's now found its way into the trans religion that says, actually, we don't need women's sports after all, exactly what people were saying 20 years ago in the country. Thanks for bringing it up. It's a fraught question, and I, and I respect the ability to talk about it freely in the open. Thank you. A number of questions were submitted related to energy, so I'll summarize them into one. Sure. Is there an energy policy that is mindful of the environment, doesn't undermine our economy, and provides some relief for the folks in the Northeast who are already dealing with kind of record inflation? Yes. So you will find other Republican candidates who will say what is culturally accepted as the reasonable thing to say right now, which is, yeah, we need to balance all of that, move towards so-called green energy to address climate change, and take an all-of-the-above approach. That sounds nice, but let's get real. Wind and solar would not stand on their own two feet without government subsidies to prop them up. They still require 24-7 electric backup, and there are trade-offs and opportunity costs of capital that we create. So I'm gonna separate two issues relating to clean energy. One is, do we believe in clean air and clean water? Yes, we do, yes, I do. Okay, that's Teddy Roosevelt-style conservatism. Do we believe in the existence of national parks? Yes, we do. I am an environmentalist in that respect. But that is different than bending the knee to this climate cult which says that carbon emissions are the end-all be-all that we must avoid. And so a sensible policy and a sensible energy policy, I think, requires abandoning. I don't mean modifying. I don't mean just being a little bit reasonable. Let's all shake hands, be moderate, compromise, and get along stuff. No. I mean abandoning the demands of the carbon, anti-carbon framework. I think it is based on a set of false premises that impair human prosperity today. I was sharing this with actually a journalist just before this interview, we were just having a chat about the fact that the climate disaster related death rate, what does that mean? The number of people who die of climate related disasters, tornadoes, hurricanes, heat waves, is down by 98% over the last century. Raise your hand if you've heard that fact before. Good. Some of you, well, more than I expected, even if it was a quarter of you, 20% of you. That doesn't make it into the climate debate because it's inconvenient, an inconvenient truth, if you will, for the narrative. So what does a sensible energy policy look like? It means you can't pollute in a river. It means you can't just pollute in air without actually bearing the cost of that behavior. You can't be a train that rolls off the tracks an hour from where I live in central Ohio and expect no accountability. But that has nothing to do with climate change. As it relates to climate change, we need to abandon the anti-carbon framework altogether and go back to asking a basic question of what fosters human prosperity? What fosters human flourishing? And the right answer to that includes drilling, fracking, burning coal, and yes, embracing nuclear energy too. That is what a sensible energy policy in this country looks like. That is something you're not supposed to say in public right now. But what I've found in traveling this country is that most people who are paying for those gas prices at the pump or the rising food prices, because energy is a big component of inflation in this country, quietly agree with me. And I think that if we're able to break down those barriers and to actually speak frankly, this climate religion falls under the weight of its own contradictions, and we can actually unshackle the American energy sector again. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. So, so New Hampshire is special, and you know, there's sort of a big issue with the opioid crisis. And uh, do you think that there's any way to address 
said that outside of crime reduction, we need some strategy to sort of be an employee right now. Yeah, I think there's a way to address it. So the opioid crisis in this country is mostly driven by a supply side problem. What does that mean? It means the supply of fentanyl, I'm going to talk about the fentanyl crisis in particular, actually, I want to be very specific, because that's, that's really the number one killer right now in America, about 100,000 deaths per year due to fentanyl, most of which illegally crosses the southern border, most of which is manufactured with raw materials from China, and I kid you not, from Wuhan, China. Actually, 800 of those chemists, hundreds of those chemists, I think up to 800 of them, are now south of the Mexican border, helping manufacture fentanyl. Why? Because it's the equivalent of an opium war onto the United States. Well, it's working. So you want to address it, you solve the supply problem. You use the U.S. military to secure the border, and if necessary, use the U.S. military to annihilate the drug cartels that pump that fentanyl across the border. If we can use it to address problems somewhere halfway around the world in the Middle East or God knows where in some other hemisphere, we can use it to protect Americans on our own soil. This is achievable. A U.S. president who's determined to do it can do it. No Republican and no Democrat has done it yet. I've been very clear. That's part of my agenda. It was controversial when I first proposed it. Other candidates are now coming along behind with me. That is how I will end the fentanyl crisis as the next U.S. president. It's just going to take the guts and conviction of spine to actually do it. And this is part of, the, part of the whole case for my candidacy, by the way. Right, Donald Trump went far with the America First agenda as far as he could. But if we want to actually get the job done, we're going to have to go far further than he did. And I think we can do that and unite the country. Because I don't care if you're Republican or Democrat, if you're black or white, the fentanyl crisis is wrong. And whoever the president is cannot sit idly by and watch 150 times the number of people that died on 9-11 die each year in this country without doing something about it. If the U.S. military was created to do anything, it is to protect Americans on our own home turf. And as U.S. president, your commander-in-chief, I will act accordingly to get that done in the first year in office. And I think that will deliver a sense of national pride and even revive pride even within our own military that the U.S. military can be used to actually do good, measurable good, for Americans in this country? Great question. Thank you very much. So my name is Errol. Um, I'm serving at NC. Nice. And um, I just uh, wanted to ask, uh, just because you seem to be a fan of personal liberties, also, um, if you would be in favor of protecting women's right to choose or So this is a tough issue. So I'll, I'll answer the question directly, and then I'll get into where I think the rubber hits the road on this issue. So I'm, I'm unapologetically pro-life. I picked that up probably. I was persuaded of it when I was in high school. I'm not Catholic, but I went to a Catholic high school. It was a big part of my high school upbringing. Here's what makes this a tough issue. It's whose liberty is at stake. So I'll give you a thought experiment. I'll ask you a question. And just you don't have to permanent, but just what your gut instinct is. I'd be curious for your response to this. It's a question that a Supreme Court justice asked last year. Say a woman, a pregnant woman, is assaulted on the street, and the unborn child dies as a result. Do you think that the attacker should be liable for that death? What's your view on that? Yeah, forget the law, but your instinct is that some, there's something inherently something wrong with that death. wrong about that, but definitely uh, doesn't excuse, you know, banning. Yeah, we'll get to back to the issue. Yeah. Good. There was an honest answer on your part. Actually, a lot of people who are pro-choice, understanding this discussion when that comes up, will say that, understand the position they're supposed to take. But that was a very honest answer, which I appreciate. I think most people acknowledge that there's a, there's a human rights issue there. However, I think here's where conservatives fall short is that we say we're pro-life, but we don't walk the walk because we make it about just putting and pinning all of that responsibility on the woman. 
And so what I think we need to do is we need to recognize that this is a question where two different sets of rights come into conflict with one another. The right of the unborn child and the right of the woman who bears real physical cost in carrying that child to term. I think we have not yet done all we can do as a society to say that we're actually in that together. It's not about men versus women. It's about saying that pro-adoption policy, policies that help foster childcare for women who would otherwise be in a difficult circumstance were they to actually see that child to term. And then an era of paternity tests, including high fidelity genetic tests, greater responsibility for men than the system currently applies for including beyond financial responsibility for a child that a woman actually ends up having to carry to term. I acknowledge this is a difficult issue. We're not gonna, I think there's gonna be very little automatic persuasion of one side of the other, but I do think that there can still be peaceful coexistence in this country by recognizing that we can at least do our best to be all in this together, to not make this a women's rights issue, but to make it a human rights issue. And I think once we do that, I think most of us share an intuition that there is something to this being more than just a mass of cells that's unborn, but that there is an issue of life, but we're facing an asymmetric obligation and constraint between men and women. Let's do as much as we can to close that gap. And I think that's about as far as we're gonna get as a country on that issue. The last thing I will say is that this is now not a job really for the President of the United States. After Dobbs, this is an issue for the states. And so if you're deciding who to vote for in your governor's race, that could actually be a pretty relevant input. But my view is the overturning of Roe on legal grounds was correct, which puts this issue to the states, which is where it belongs. And I thank you for being brave to stand up and ask a question that you probably knew was likely that I'd have a different opinion than, than you did. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. Thank you. Before we wrap up, I've got one, one question I want to pass on on behalf of one of my classes, a teacher course on sure. political corruption in America this semester. Okay. So on behalf of the students from that class, I want to share a question with you. What do you see as some of the major uh, obstacles preventing the United States from eliminating kind of corruption at the federal level? And what are some of the steps you might take to weed out that political corruption? So one obvious answer, and it's just true. It actually used to come from the left. I think this is an opportunity for the Republican Party to own this message going forward, but it's not a partisan message, is the influence of dollars on the electoral process. There's something that I've seen firsthand from being a candidate. I'm 37 years old, but I've lived the full arc of the American dream. I'll be very honest with you guys. I've put an eight-figure check of my own money into this campaign already. We're raising a lot of small dollar donors, people giving $1 or $5. That's the kind of campaign we're running. You don't know why? Because I recoil at the idea of bending the knee to some donor class that views many politicians as nothing more than their puppets. Democrat party, Republican party, doesn't matter. It's how the game is played. Democrats used to be the ones that might keep money out of politics. Now George Soros' son apparently has visited the White House 14, 16 times during President Biden alone. Yeah, it's not like the Republican side is that much better, by the way. This is actually the, the main source of it. Private money is the mother's milk of politics. And I think we need to get to a place where we can declare independence from the donor class in this country. That used to be a Democrat message. Not anymore. You don't hear that from the left anymore, but you don't hear from Republicans either. I'm actually bringing that back in the avatar of the Republican Party. I think that's answer number one. Answer number two is the administrative state. So we're told, we're taught... You know, your high school, your, your history teacher is probably pretty good. Your government teacher might have taught you that we live in a constitutional republic with three branches of government, the legislative branch, the executive branch, and the judicial branch. And then we have separation of powers, checks and balances. Sounds pretty good. It might tell you that the people who you elect to run the government are the ones who actually run the government. Today, that's a myth. The people we elect to run the government today are not the ones who run the government. It is a permanent state, an administrative class, in Washington, D.C. that actually runs the show. They view the elected officials as a sort of cute little inconvenience that comes and goes every few years, but it's the real bureaucratic class that really knows what to do that's in the national self-interest and they get it done. That's something I'm 
pledging to change as the next president, when I say I'm shutting down government agencies, what we're really doing, it's not just saving the money. That's just a side benefit. The real answer is we're restoring a three-part system of government that with actual checks and balances where the people who we elect to run the government, including the president of the United States, is the one who actually runs the government. Whether it's my guy or the other guy, it doesn't matter. It better darn well be the guy who we elected to put into that White House that actually runs that executive branch. That isn't the case today. It wasn't under Obama. It wasn't under Trump. It isn't under Biden. Under my presidency, if I'm elected and put there, I absolutely will be a president who fires half that federal bureaucracy and they'll get sued. But I want to get sued over it. You want to know why? Because then we take it to the Supreme Court and the current Supreme Court agrees with me on this interpretation of the Constitution. And then we get it codified in law, in judicial precedent, where then every president after me can do what the last five presidents before me, at least since Reagan, haven't done, which is actually be empowered to run the country because the people of this country elected me to put me there. Great last question, and hope you pass along those answers to the kids in your class. Thank you. I appreciate it. And let me just say one thing before if we're, if we're wrapping this up is the civic engagement, I just think, is so important in this country. You know, you, you, it would be weird if you agreed with 100% of the things I said. But if you agree with the philosophy behind the campaign that you want to start talking openly in this country and expect the same of politicians in return, join our movement. You don't have to agree with me. You don't even have to know you're going to vote for me. But join our movement, and we want to get people in this state engaged in this cycle in a way that hasn't happened before. You should register to vote. but. Tonight, you can actually register for our mailing list. We can be in touch with you. We want to actually spark the conversation we had tonight and light it up across the state. So every one of you agree or not before you leave, that's our ask of you. Be part of speaking freely again in this country. And I thank you for the opportunity you had to open that conversation up tonight. Thank you. It was a pleasure to have you. Can we please hear it for Mr. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Appreciate your time. Yeah. This is a great, great event. Great oh, event. Sorry, the heat. Oh, that's okay. It's a little warm, but <laughs> see, I can't handle the heat standing yeah. different. <laughs> right. Do you have some of the folks that wanted to just get pictures of? Yeah, let's get some pictures. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. You want to do some right here? Yeah, yeah we can take some, some pictures right here. Thank you. Come on over. So nice to see you, young person running for president. Thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Spread the word. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Can't wait to vote for you. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Spread the word. Get involved with the campaign itself. Oh. Yeah. Of course. Can I hold this up? There we go. Well.